Hello, good afternoon. Hello, it's, it's call and response. Hello, everybody. Hey, welcome to McMillan Cafe. How many, time, how many people, is this their first time in this beautiful space? Raise your hand, isn't it gorgeous? Well, welcome. Hello, my name is uh, Jill Stratton. I'm Associate Dean for Undergraduate Residential Learning at Washington U. And on behalf of my colleague, Dr. Otis Johnson over here, we'd like to welcome you to this talk. Uh, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker in just a minute, but we're very excited uh, to welcome you back from campus. We missed you. You had a very long break. You're gone for five weeks. We're so glad that you're back. Uh, I know a few of you all from a class I taught last semester. How many people were in psychology of young adulthood? A few people. Hi, hi there. Welcome. I'm also teaching a class this semester called Bad Leadership. They say, they say you teach what you know, so they put me in charge. Uh, so anyway, but we're, uh, again, we're very uh, delighted that you're here. Also, we have several of your instructors for identity literacy that are here today, and I want to acknowledge them. I wrote them down so I would not forget them. Dr. Nancy Berg, Dr. Aaron McLaughlin, Dr. Angela Brown, Dr. Lerone Martin, Ms. Valronica Scales, thank you, woohoo. And I also would like to say thank you to Gail Boker for helping uh, arrange today's talk. Gail, thank you. Everybody, thank you, Gail. Uh, and then an, another person before I do my introductions, I make sure I didn't miss any of our instructors. I hope I didn't. Did I miss somebody? No, I did not. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Zach Romo. So Zach is the person who, gets, who sends you tons of emails. He is my right-hand person. He has really made identity literacy uh, very functional and very... Uh, and have flowed very smoothly. He's a 2014 Washington U grad, and he's back in the corner with a sh short crew cut. Zach Romo, everybody. Okay. We will be, um, we know you have a class on Saturday, and your last class of identity literacy is uh, February 2nd. You are the first people to take this class, and we want your feedback. It's a pilot, and our goal is by 2018 for every first year student at Washington U to take this class. And we, we really appreciate your feedback. We know that there's been a couple of speed bumps, but we think overall we've been really happy with your, with your presence in the class and our instructors in particular for taking this on. You read a book over winter break called Marbles, and we're very delighted that we have a very distinguished guest from our medical school, a faculty member who will be joining us today to give a keynote talk. She's sitting right here, Dr. Ann Glowinski. I'm going to introduce her to you. Let's all let's give her a round of applause. Thank you. Dr. Glowinski is the training director and associate director for the Division of Children and Adolescent Psychiatry at Washington University School of Medicine. As a professor at the medical school, her research is focused on developmental psychopathology. She is involved in medical education nationally and internationally. I had a chance to review her curriculum beta. It was about 15 pages long. This woman is an incredible researcher, faculty member, and advocate. We are delighted to have her speak to our first-year students in identity literacy. Please welcome Dr. Ann Glowinski. Thank you. Good afternoon. And also welcome back to your classes. I understand you restarted classes about yesterday, <laughs> two days ago. Okay. So, First thing about me, I'm a low talker, you know, like in the show Seinfeld. So if you can't hear me, you go like this. I also have a French accent, obviously. I'll come back to that. I cannot change that. But if you can't understand something, please let me know. And then I have a cold, so it's sort of a perfect uh, convergence of, of things. Since we are acknowledging, I would like to acknowledge Robert Gallo, who is sitting in the front. He is a medical student at WashU in the first year class and was a WashU student. He graduated last year. Uh, and I'm very fortunate that Robert volunteered to help me think about what I would talk to you about today. And why is that important? It's important because I'm familiar with your age group, but you're not my usual students. Um, and also, even though one of my strengths as a teacher is that I'm actually pretty good at thinking like other people, I'm still pretty old. I don't remember what it's like to encounter mental health issues for the first time. It's just been too long that they've been in my life, that they've been part of my expertise. So it was really important for me to 
to talk to Robert to recalibrate a little bit to, to, to think about what would it be like for somebody like you who is smart, who probably knows a whole lot more about mental health than I did when I was your age, because there's been progress in the world, but still who doesn't necessarily know as much as you're gonna know in the future. So this is, thank you. And we'll come back a little bit more to your contributions at the end. I'm going to try to leave a lot of time for question and answers, especially because it's a pilot, but I also want to cover a lot of things. So the first thing is whenever the first thing is whenever we have to make a talk, we have to give disclosures, and it always strikes me, not just today, that these disclosures really have to do with, in some ways, the least interesting things about my identity, which are the funding that I get, the the, 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 or the advisory board that I'm not. And so usually, not just today, this is the part where there's a little person inside me who thinks, I really want to tell them what kind of chocolate I like, or, you know, like when I see the word disclosure, I'm like, but this is not a disclosure. A disclosure is, I really like ceviche. <laughs> Do you know, you know, so, so I'm always thinking like that. Uh, because I'm a little goofy, but so today, this is identity. I'm, act I'm actually going to, to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, and I will start by telling you that uh, in addition to being a child psychiatrist, and I'm gonna tell you what that entails. So child psychiatrist means that after college, I did four years of medical school, so I'm a physician. After medical school, I did a residency in general psychiatry, which takes three or four years. And after that, I did another residency to work with families and children and adolescents. So I'm trained to work with adults and children and adolescents and families. I also did research fellowships, but that's idiosyncratic to my training. It's not the required part of child psychiatry training. So in addition to being a child psychiatrist, and by the way, loving my job a lot, uh, I am also the mother of three sons who, as you can see on the picture, are sometimes helpful, <laughs> sometimes. Um, and this was 10 years ago. This was possibly the peak of their helpfulness, but, <laughs> but, but um, they, they occasionally do their chores. Um, and actually my oldest son, Jacques, some of you may have gone to school with him. He's a freshman uh, at uh, Lawrence University in Wisconsin. Uh, and so, one of the things that I want to subliminally communicate here is that we are gonna have to roll up our sleeves when it comes to mental health and diversity. So soak up this image and, and uh, think about that. The other thing that I want to disclose is that as I told you, I'm from France. And what does that mean? It means that a little bit more than you guys, I grew up with comics and some of you may be from France or from Europe, so in that case, you know exactly what I mean. But so in France, and in many countries in Europe, comics, which we call bande dessinée or drawn bands, they're, they're like another form of art, like music or theater. They're very, very important. So these characters, for example, were really part of my childhood and, and, and helped shape uh, our development. So comic book characters are very important. The reason I'm telling you this is because I really think that in addition to my mental health expertise, this is really why I was asked to be here today. Uh, Rebecca Wanzo, who was the first person who asked me, knew that I loved comic books. We bonded over that. This is really why our friendship started. And so she, she knew that I'd be very enthusiastic to use marbles as a medium. And so what do I like about comics before we jump into marbles? What I like is that it can communicate ideas in a way that no matter how well spoken your words are or how beautifully organized they are on a piece of paper, uh, basically it shortcuts to a kind of understanding that is otherwise difficult to achieve. So this is one uh, of my favorite images and to illustrate that uh, by a guy called Gottlieb who is completely obsessed with this event in history of Newton receiving an apple on his head and then immediately understanding something about the universe. And he has a lot of variation about that. And 
you, you may not be as enamored of this as I am, but it's the idea that you, you get how funny that story is more than when you hear it because of this illustrated uh, 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 story. Um, to, to further illustrate how important this is, in Europe, some of the mental health advocacy efforts use comic books as a medium way more than uh, in this continent. So, for example, um, efforts to help with suicide in the young, which is a problem in every country in the world, and I will give you some numbers. It is a problem in every country in the world. It's a number two or three cause of death in every country in the world for the ages between 14 and 45. So efforts to change that uh, use comic books as a medium. So this is a book that is actually uh, available in Francophone Switzerland uh, and it contains vignettes, stories of young people struggling with mental health issues and then illustrates how they might avail themselves of resources or how they might find alternatives in particular to suicide. Um, these are my kids in a comic book. So what are we talking about uh, in a comic book store? What are we talking about? I'm going to give you a very brief background, uh, giving this audience an actual background in mental health would be daunting, mm -hmm. right? And it's not the purpose or the scope of this particular lecture, but I'm going to try to hit on certain facts and numbers that would be important for you to know about, for all of us to know about. And then we're going to unpack marbles a little bit. I know that you're going to unpack marbles further in small group discussions with your instructors, so the purpose is not to substitute that. The, the purpose is more to give you, um, as a child psychiatrist, as a psychiatrist, my feeling of what the biggest themes that are really addressed in this book are, uh, and, and, and draw them out. By the way, you're welcome to interrupt and ask questions at any point. Uh, and then we're going to talk a bit about mental health diversity and, and on some resources so that you have that moving forward even after this course. Ready? Okay. So let's start with brief background. So I was thinking a lot about how to do this and do it fast. And I felt that having a global perspective would probably be the best. So not just a perspective in the United States or not just a perspective in a certain age group, or not just a perspective on mood disorders, which is what uh, Ellen Forney is covering in her book, but a perspective on mental health. So we are fortunate because in 2013, the World Health Organization released the result of 20 years of research, which has to do with studying the global burden of disorders across the world. And unlike the previous iteration of this study, they actually were able to study many more aspects of mental health and also many more countries. So we're gonna open uh, a section of the World Health Organization um, website on the global burden of disease. And we're going to read 10 facts about mental health and I'm gonna provide a little bit of a commentary. So fact number one, around 20% of the world's children and adolescents have mental disorders or problems. They also go on to describe that about half of mental disorders begin before the age of 14. So I will tell you, as somebody who does research, that that number is actually a underestimate because um, when you study mental disorders and you try to figure out when they start, there's a sort of retrospective bias. It's hard for people to remember. It's like when, if I were asking you questions about your past, you would tend to pull some events a little bit closer to the age at which you're being asked. So in, in reality, we're talking about probably even before 14, more like 12 or 13. In addition, uh, what, what is described here is that these disorders are found across every culture. So that's really important because if you read the media, you may have a perception that ADHD, for example, is a US disorder. So 
It's not. It's just that perhaps we use more medications in the United States, but it doesn't mean that the symptoms and the syndromes are not found with the same prevalences uh, across all these countries. Um, and then in addition, what is stated here is that most low and middle income countries have only one child psychiatrist for every one to four million people. That's if they're lucky. When I was in China in 2009, people could not give me an estimate of how many psychiatrists for children they were for a billion people, but the estimate was that it was much less than one for four million people. There was maybe one or two persons for the whole country who were specifically practicing child and adolescent psychiatry. So what else can I tell you that the WHO wants us to know about? Number two, very important, mental and substance use disorders are the leading cause of disability worldwide. So let's stop for a second. We know that this world has many areas that are ravaged by war, disease, and yet this is, this is the fact leading cause of disability worldwide, mental and substance use disorders. About 800,000 people commit suicide every year. Um, what's important about suicide, besides the fact that uh, it is preventable, and, and many people don't know that, uh, is that it hits an age group that is particularly not likely to die. So even though it is true that older people have higher rates of suicide, young people who are healthy, when they die, are more likely to die by suicide than from other reasons. So it's, it's a very important phenomenon to study. Um, and one thing that I should tell you is that many studies have confirmed that suicide is not a random event of human nature that occurs out of the blue, even though sometimes the media reports it that way, where you know, they talk about such and such um, businessman who jumps off a building, or, and, and they may emphasize one aspect of his story, like financial problems or divorce. In reality, most studies of suicide show that people typically have one or more serious mental disorders when they commit suicide. Fact number four, which relates to my point about the world, is that war and disasters have a large impact on mental health and psychosocial well-being. And, and what's uh, important about that is that usually those are times when resources are very scant, and these are even less prioritized than usual. We're gonna talk about the fact that they're not prioritized usually, but they're even less prioritized than usual. Number five, very important for those of you who are interested in medicine and not psychiatry or in interested in social work or interested in any number of things, mental disorders are important risk factors for other diseases as well as unintentional and intentional injury. So let's talk about that for a moment. First of all, it's not just that they're risk factors. For example, uh, Dr. Brown is a cardiologist and she knows very well that Cardiac disease and depression share risk factors. But in addition, she knows as a cardiologist that some of her patients who have hypertension or who have cardiac disease are going to be more difficult to treat if their mental disorders are not treated. So it's also it, it can complicate the access to care and the treatment in addition to directly affect your health. In terms of unintentional injuries. So I told you that suicide was number two or number three cause of death across the world for young people. And by young people, I mean up to 44, which I know for you is not young at all, but <laughs> for me is super young. So um, in, in sort of going along that, uh, what are the other causes of death? So homicide is one of them. And the other one is unintentional injury, like falling from a car or having a car accident. So this may be something that you know very well or you may not have thought about it, but these are things that are also impacted by mental health. And I don't mean that um, homicide is just related to mental health as in people who have mental illness um, commit murder. I mean that people who have mental disorders are at higher risk of being killed. 
So you need to know that they are at higher risk of being killed in part because mental disorders can cause a downward drift in your living condition where you're more likely to be exposed to situations that are dangerous. In addition, unintentional injuries, uh, using your judgment, how, whether you put your seat belt, uh, whether you're putting a helmet when you're on your bike, all these things can be affected also by um, mental health issues. Stigma and discrimination against patients and families prevent people from seeking mental health care. We're gonna talk about that a little bit in marbles. What's important about that is that, first of all, it's hard for people to, to get medical care, period. So I, I wanna make sure that we understand it's not just mental health care. But I think that what, what this is telling us is that stigma is a particularly pernicious aspect of care provision for mental disorders and that what happens because it leads to secrecy and shame, it makes it less likely that people acknowledge to themselves to their loved ones that they have a problem or they're more fe fearful. So for example, in medicine, one of the things that I see a lot are young people who are afraid that if they disclose those mental disorders, it will somehow affect their careers, which is not the case, but it is a fear that they have. Human rights and violations of people with mental and psychosocial disability are routinely reported in most countries. So this is a very big topic. There are countries where attempting uh, suicide is considered a crime. People are in prison when they're suicidal. There are also countries where people are controlled, just like in asylums of old. I don't know if you've seen, for example, the movie Amadeus, or, but so basically uh, people are chained people are treated in a very dehumanized way when they have severe symptoms of mental illness that are disruptive to society. Um, globally, there's huge inequity in the distribution of skilled human resources um, for mental health. So going back to what we were talking about for developing countries, and even in the United States, if you look at the map of the United States, let's just go with that. Uh, there are way more psychiatrists in Boston and in San Francisco and in New York City than in rural Arkansas. So there's a big distribution where the areas which, distribution problem, the areas that need mental health the most have it the least. There are five key barriers to increasing mental health service availability. So the ones that are listed are absence of mental health from the public health agenda. I have another presentation that I give, actually I'll give that to your class, Robert. And um, I go through a study that examines public health agendas of 132 countries. I think that eight countries actually specifically have children mental health on their agenda and maybe two handfuls have mental health as a specific uh, agenda. And this has implications for funding. The current organization of mental health services, this is true very much in this country, lack of integration with primary care, inadequate human resources for mental health and lack of public mental health leadership. And then finally, Financial resources to increase services are relatively modest. So the estimate is that um, it's basically $2 per capita per year in low income countries and in the, and, 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 but even in rich countries, it is disproportionately less than for other medical problems. I will tell you something positive about St. Louis because I'm afraid I have thoroughly depressed you at this point. We actually have a program in St. Louis County that is very innovative there's a tax to the dollar that actually goes for children mental health. And this has led to the development of many, many mental health services that didn't exist a decade ago. In fact, this morning I was in court as part of one of these programs where we work with children who are in the foster care system. So there are definitely buckets um, uh, of better funding. Okay, so I think this is one of those things where 
I need to go back to my presentation and it might take me just a minute. There we go. So now that we've gone through these facts, let's take a deep breath and go into the other aspect um, of what we are going to talk about more in depth, which is the fact that stigma um, is enduring and well quantified. I can't review the entire literature on stigma, but what I can tell you is that in general, there was a lot of optimism that with people understanding more that mental health, is common, mental health problems are common, uh, that they affect people across every socioeconomic group, uh, that mental disorders are more treatable than they used to be. There was a big hope that stigma would decrease. And what recent research has shown is that, in fact, that is not yet the case in general across sectors. So what's happened is that, yes, it's true. People, your generation knows a whole lot more about mental disorders than our generation did, and in part because there's a lot more that is known about mental disorders. Uh, there are also perceptions that mental disorders or aspects of them can be treated. But the continued association of um, mental problems with something scary, violent, unpredictable, undesirable persists. And this is something that is picked up both in surveys where people are asked to think about associations, but also in experimental designs that span um, every age group. So an example of an experimental design would be for me to take two kids and basically tell one of them, you know, here is Timmy and you're gonna play with Timmy. And then I'd say, by the way, Timmy has ADHD. Or I say, Timmy doesn't have ADHD. And then you sort of observe what happens. And what happens across every age group is that first of all, once you know that Timmy has ADHD, he sort of has cooties a little bit. Secondly, Timmy is behaving more uncomfortably because he knows that the other guy knows that he has ADHD. So it's very powerful. And I'm not saying that this is true across the board. I think we all know people who are very comfortable with disclosing their mental health history. But in general, there is still a stigma that is also internalized. So that has also been described that the stigma is both in the general population, in the medical profession, in psychiatrists, and in patients. So it spans um, the entire spectrum. So let's talk about marbles. And then let me also keep an eye on the time. Okay. So one of the things that Ellen Horney teaches us about if we don't know about it is that she has a mood disorder and she has this great picture of trying to put a mood disorder in perspective and so what is a mood disorder first of all mood disorder one of the most common category of psychiatric disorder very very common uh, to give you an idea it's estimated that maybe 30 percent of women in america are going to experience by the time you're my age I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but you, you, you imagine. So, so by the time you're slightly less young, you have a 30% lifetime chance of having had major depression. So it's almost like the common cold. It's very, very common. Um, and she has bipolar disorder, which is less common. So maybe one to 2% of people lifetime are going to experience that. But mood disorders are very common. What are they? We know that they're caused by environmental and genetic factors that's been studied across many research designs. And, and by environmental factors, I mean some that we don't know, maybe viral factors, but also things that we understand better, like trauma, family factors, things that happen to people that are stressful early in life and that may predispose them to having a mood disorder. And then genetic factors. So for example, bipolar disorder is highly irritable. It doesn't mean that you're gonna get it if your mom has it, but you're at much higher risk than other people in the general population. So she lists the, the, the mood disorders. So we have bipolar one, um, which is having had in your life at least major depression episode and a manic episode. And then bipolar two, 
you have mood swings, but they never get to the level of mania. Cyclothymia is less severe, but it's a um, fluctuation of mood with basically less intensity. And then unipolar depression is what I refer to as major depression. And this dynia is a um, sort of chronic low grade depression, which has less symptoms and is less severe than major depression, but is nevertheless very impairing. So one of the point I'm going to make, because I don't know how many of you, so in this group, like every group, we're gonna have people who have had this, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. And you also, we have people who have had friends who had this, or parents, or, and we also have people who have read about it. Or, and so, especially if you've read certain books, like for example, Kate Jemison, who wrote a book called Touch by Fire, you may have thought, because she, she can be very eloquent, even though she's reporting how difficult it is to have this illness, there's a little bit of subtext of, you know, we're exceptional and there are many artists who have bipolar disorders. So I know from working with children that sometimes people read these books and they're like, wow, this, this sounds cool. This actually sounds really cool. So what I like about this particular image is that this actually illustrates the illusion that this is cool. So just like you can romanticize depression and be like, oh, this is great, you know, like I can stay in bed and, and basically be a little bit sad. So here in this picture, she's saying, well, this is actually really manageable because when I'm manic, I'm gonna do all my productive stuff. And then in a way, it's, it's like that story in the Bible, you know, like you're gonna store for, for lean years and you're gonna store all your grain and then after that, you're gonna have enough to eat. So she's imagining as she's learning about her disorder that it's not so bad because really she can, she can make it work. She can have this yin yang and when she's sad, she sort of rests and then when she's happy, she works for when she's sad. It's not that controllable. So part of the things that, and she illustrates that, but part of what I need to tell you is that it's not that romantic and it's not that controllable. It feels bad. Um, and even if truthfully there are times in mania that are vanishingly pleasant because it's true, you have energy and she illustrates that. You have energy, you, you're, you're talking to everybody including Madonna or you, you think you could talk to Madonna. It's, not, it's typically not stable. You don't live at that energy level. It, it often degenerates into something that's out of control where you do things that are harmful to you and to others. Not necessarily harmful in a violent way, but basically you do things that you wouldn't do in your relationships usually. And unfortunately, you can estrange yourself from people quite a bit during this time. So this is, I, I really like that because I think it, it is what we wish a mood disorder was, something that made it so fun. It's, it's not fun. It can be recycled for good use. So I will tell you that if you understand your depression well, you certainly have a chance of using it for resiliency, just like you can use any experience that is difficult in your life for residency, but it's not a given. It's not like it's a gift that, that just grows on its own. You, you really have to work at it. Another thing that she does that is really well done and well illustrated is show you that this is a force of nature. So what I like about this is she is illustrating something that sometimes I try to explain to my students and that we call flight of ideas. So flight of ideas, like for example, right now I'm going from one thing to another and for the most part, even though I have a cold, so it's maybe a little bit less well connected than usual, it is connected. You, you, you can tell from my last sentence a little bit where I'm gonna go with my next sentence. So with flight of idea, there is still a connection between ideas, but it's going so fast that it's hard to follow, and sometimes it goes to places where you don't expect it to go. And I think she illustrates that. So for her, there is a relationship between all those bubbles, but it might be hard for somebody to follow. When somebody gets really psychotic, by the way, you can have a complete disconnection between these bubbles. So it can really be, if you're in the audience, 
difficult to understand what the relationship is between the previous and the next thought that the person is having, the ones that they're expressing. It can also be that there's an internal logic, you're just not picking it up. So as a psychiatrist, we often really try to understand if there's some kind of internal logic. Sometimes there's no internal logic. It's really very, very disconnected. Another thing that she does very well is show you how no fun depression is. So this is when she's depressed and basically, I don't know about you, but you see this and you get the sense that she really has enough energy. She's like an hibernating bear. She, she has enough energy maybe to get up, go to the bathroom, and even then she has to take her blankets. Uh, you don't even see her eat. So in fact, this is, this is a particularly high risk state for losing a lot of weight. So I want you to imagine if you're a woman, for example, and you have children and this is how you feel and you're supposed to take care of children. So if you're a student and you, you're supposed to do your homework and you're supposed to, to, to be happy and have fun because you're in college, it's very difficult. But also if you have certain roles. So one of the things that we look at when we're measuring impairment related to mental disorders is what, how is this affecting people? Can they work? How are they relating to others? And how are they functioning in certain key roles that they have? So for example, in her age group, this could be a parenting age group. And studies are showing, by the way, that it's hard on average. So for moms who have depression, it's not just harder for them to take care of their children. They actually, on average, don't, it's, it's impossible for them to do an as good a job as they would otherwise. So for example, looking at outcomes across nutrition, across hygiene, across uh, whether you're keeping your kids safe, whether you're putting a seat belt on them when they're in a car, things like that. It's, it is impaired, in fact, by having depression. So one of the things that Robert wrote to me, because he, he put together this very, very nice piece, which was thinking about in a sense, the experience, so I think he knows you knew this was about stigma, so sort of thinking about the experience of being a freshman in college and how that is an experience that by definition has its challenges for a lot of you leaving home uh, and being really ready to leave home, by the way. I have a freshman, so I understand how you, you were ready, but at the same time, you know, suddenly, you have to figure out how to wash the socks and you have to, um, to figure out how to do a number of things, how to keep stretch your money sometimes, how to, how to um, use resources that are not necessarily your typical to-go resources all of a sudden. So you have to create a new life for yourself. And I think you talked very eloquently about how in that context, some of her feelings, even though they're way more intense, are familiar some anxieties or some um, feeling lower, or also you talked about, in a sense, an experience that I think a lot of you have, which is, am I as good as all these other smart people? Uh, in medicine, we talk about the imposter syndrome, which every doctor has. So basically, you get into medical school. Technically, you're supposed to be smart. It's a high select group, and we all, well, not all, but many of us, at least for years, go through a phase of, there must be a mistake. So first of all, they let me in, but it was probably an error. I fooled them. So basically, low self-esteem is actually not something that you sheltered from when you're smart. In fact, I will tell you that studies show that the smarter you are, the more you doubt yourself. So if you doubt yourself, that's just because you're smart. So embrace it, just move on, it's, it's okay. And, and then just be happy that you're smart enough that you doubt yourself. So, so the bottom line is that you felt that there was something relatable. And in fact, what, what research on stigma is showing is that that is very important. So the more people can relate to mental disorders as something that is actually not that foreign, but, but basically is relatable, the more stigma decreases. So of all the mental disorders, 
the ones that are the most stigmatized are the ones that are incomprehensible. So for example, the person who, who's walking around and muttering <coughs> incomprehensible things, wearing layers of clothing that don't make any sense in the middle of summer. So th those are the people that are perhaps the most scary because they're difficult to, uh, to understand. Um, I think what she's explaining here is that um, her amplitude, her reaction, so even though you can relate to it, is, is with, with, without a doubt outside of the norm of what the normal emotion would be. So another thing that she talks about is basically this moment when she goes like, oh, well, okay, I have a disorder. I have a disorder. This is the name of this disorder. I belong to this group of people who have this disorder. So I will tell you, first of all, that I personally think that any illness gives you pause. So I have high blood pressure. And basically, when I was diagnosed with that, I, I had to integrate that into my identity. It felt weird. It, it sort of felt like I didn't want it. I really, it didn't fit with Anne Lewinsky. Like, what is this high blood pressure? Can it go away? So it, it took me a, a bit of, maybe it's, it will go away if I do this, if I eat well, if I, but, but basically, so I think any illness brings this burden, this hot potato of, you know, okay, here I am, and what are you going to do with me? When it's a mental disorder, I think that the risk that the hot potato is more carrying of internalized shame and stigma is higher. So you, you don't feel at your best when you're diagnosed with any illness. But if it's an illness that has this message of, well, I must be weak or I did something wrong or, or basically this is shameful, this, this doesn't go with my image. I, I, I'm not supposed to be somebody who has this illness that is for people who are just not good. You, the, the internal contradiction between your identity and the illness is just so much worse. And so she's illustrating it. She's lo looking, she's like, she's like in jail. Suddenly she's a felon. She's being slapped with this particular label. There's been a lot of research on labels. A lot of people think, well, is, is the label what is harmful? And what I can tell you is that if you have the illness and you have the symptoms and you're impaired, it is no longer just the label that is harmful. I mean, in general, what becomes more harmful is, is, is sometimes the layer of secrecy and isolation and, and, and basically distancing that is created between you and others in part because you have this burden that you cannot share. But, but there has been research on label, and I told you the story of Timmy. If you give him a label, people behave badly. In general, the label is only a part of it, however. So Ellen is also wondering, like, does it mean that I'm special? And, and research talks about that too. So sort of the idea that stigma and adaptation to it can, can become both a strength and a weakness. So, so you, you, can, you, can, you can sort of think, well, uh, and we see that in some minority groups. You know, it's, it's sort of this sense of exception, I'm exceptional and I'm also persecuted. Um, and I can think of any number of examples outside of this one where basically this phenomenon happens. But so she, she's sort of wondering, now that I have to accept this label, Am I going to be like cool crazy or really uncool crazy? Am I, am I going to be basically disgusting crazy or hip crazy? So, and that, that's a very normal phenomenon. So in clinic, because I am more likely to see people who have the onset of mental disorders than my colleagues who only treat adults, I deal with that a lot with children and adolescents and basically this is often a phase where, for example, I will try to talk to any number of my patients and I will say, so we, we've, we've established that you have this illness, so what do you think? 
And so I have a range of reactions. Some kids are like, I don't want to talk about it. I'll talk about it with you in a few years. I have kids who say, I really want to talk about it. It's horrible. It's like somebody died. I have some kids who go like, it's cool. You know, this is sort of cool. And usually they don't stop there, but it's it's part of part of the adaptation. So let's talk a little bit more about stigma. You guys watch John Oliver, right? You've seen this probably. So and this is because I want to make a point. Well, you're right. Mental health can be something of a touchy topic. We don't like to talk about it much. And as one psychiatrist explains, when we do, we don't talk about it well. Stigma still is a very big issue. Uh, it manifests itself in the ways that we think and talk about the, the mentally ill and in the, the terms, the words that we use to describe them. For instance? Wacko, psycho, cray cray. Okay, okay first, hearing a bearded middle-aged man use the term cray cray may have already killed that word forever. It's like when your mom says something is on fleek. It's done. It's just over at that point. But second, he is right. Cray Cray is a terrible name to call someone with mental illness. Although, it is an excellent name for a cartoon crayfish who just won a scuffling contest. <laughs> you did it, Cray Cray. You won the race. The point is, we don't, don't, we don't talk about mental illness well. Uh, sometimes, even TV personalities with doctor in their names can get it disastrously wrong. On the next Dr. Oz, everybody wants to know, am I normal or nuts? Should you be worried? This behavior is... It's not normal. Have you gone completely insane? I mean, sir, have you gone completely insane? Completely insane people go outside, suck on a rock, and bark at the moon. What the f*** is wrong with you? Sucking on a rock and barking at the moon is not a sign that someone's mentally ill. It's a sign that they are a wolf with an iron deficiency. <laughs> You're thinking of anemic wolves, Dr. Phil. You're getting confused. But perhaps the clearest sign of just how little we want to talk about mental health is that one of the only times it's actively brought up is, as we've seen yet again this week, in the aftermath of a mass shooting, as a means of steering the conversation away from gun control. This isn't guns. This is about really mental illness. In many of these shootings, we have people who have uh, mental disturbances. Do we need to do a better job in mental health? You bet we do. Yeah, it seems there is nothing like a mass shooting to suddenly spark political interest in mental health. Although it's worth noting that Governor Huckabee's state got a grade of D- minus on mental health care while he was in office. And you can't lecture people on something you got a D-. minus. <laughs> it's like passionately delivering a speech on proper English grammar by saying, we need to funk better about how we does word stuff. <laughs> we need to get it did. <laughs> and, and the aftermath of a mass shooting might actually be the worst time to talk about mental health. Because for the record, the vast majority of mentally ill people are non-violent. And the vast majority of gun violence is committed by non-mentally ill people. In fact, mentally ill people are far likelier to be the victims of violence rather than the perpetrators. So the fact we tend to only discuss mental health in a mass shooting context is deeply misleading. It would be like if the only time we talked about Coca-Cola, it were in the context of this. I'm standing here with this ice cold, thirst quenching, deliciously satisfying Coke. Thank you. So, I have to tell you that he's absolutely right. Uh, the reality about the association between violence and mental illness is that it's very small. Uh, it's not small as a recipient of violence. So mental illness is a big risk factor for being the recipient of violence. But it is, if you control for things like previous violent behavior, there's, there's almost no signal. Uh, very, very few people um, with mental disorders commit crimes. Does that mean that very few people with mental disorders are in jail? No, it does not mean that. So in fact, we know that there are, there's massive overcrowding in this country um, uh, of jail facilities with people who have mental disorders and commit minor crimes. And we also have people who are violent and who have mental illness and who are in jail, but that is not, um, that is not typically the majority. So I need to tell you something very important 
which is that the reason, and you've, you may have thought about this before, but the reason that mental health is a diversity issue, that this is an identity issue, that it belongs to this course, is because in a sense, we live in this wonderful era, which I know can be uncomfortable for some because it feels like there's a lot of political correctness, but in general, I can tell you compared to my generation where, for example, uh, sexual harassment was, it, it was considered okay. We, I, I could go um, basically um, to school and have a teacher behave in a very inappropriate way to me and we didn't even have words to talk about that and then Anita Hill happened and we were in a different world. So I think you live in a world like that where it's not okay to make derogatory remarks um, about people because of their race and religion, their sexual identity. It doesn't mean that it's not done. It doesn't mean that progress is not needed. We, by God, we know that, but basically it's, it's in our consciousness. We, we're having this course because of that. Where mental health is a category that really is in a sense, not the last frontier, but a very important frontier for this is that it, it is part of our language. It's part of our habits to make derogatory comments about mental disorders without even being conscious of it. So in fact, the Huffington Post, I think had, this is just an example, a little piece this morning or yesterday saying, here are four things that we shouldn't do. So one of them, did somebody take their meds this morning? It, it happens, like if, if, if one of your colleagues is behaving in a certain way, you might make a joke about that. And the reality is that colleague or his friend or his mom or his dad may very well be on an antidepressant. And so you're not making a huge injury, but you're making that world a little uglier for that person. Or another example, where are the M&Ms? I'm gonna kill myself if, if I don't have an M&M. So sort of making jokes and light remarks about uh, being suicidal when it's, it's, it's actually a very important cause of death, etc. So in a sense, we live in a world where issues related to mental health have not been codified to the same degree. So I get a lot of examples of that. Some of my patients go to college and for example, they have a learning disorder and one of their teachers will, without even thinking, say something, they'll write something on the board and it will be backwards and that teacher will say, oh, I have dyslexia this morning. Well, my kid has dyslexia. So you're making a joke about something that he has. And again, I don't think we internalize that these are big deals, but it contributes. If you actually look at the data that we have about stigma, it only contributes to this. Here is another aspect of the stigma. This is also from the Huffington Post, which by the way, I'm not reading all the time, but basically uh, it happened to have uh, pretty good illustrations of what I wanted to talk about. And you've seen this, right? So it's the idea of what would happen if people were using similar language for physical disorders as they do for mental disorders. So for example, I get that you have food poisoning and all, but you've got to at least make an effort. Mm -hmm. So how often would somebody hear that for depression? Very often. You just need to change your frame of mind and then you'll feel better, like somebody has just had their hand in the oven. Uh, another one would be, uh, have you tried, you know, not having the flu? So basically, have you, have you just wheeled your depression or your bipolar disorder away? Uh, I don't think it's healthy that you have to take medication every day just to feel normal. Don't you worry that it's changing you from who you really are? So that's a very common one. Sort of taking a piece of information like exercise is good for mental health. Yeah, that's true. But then somebody who's very buff is gonna come to you and say, you know, I don't believe in that crap. Look at this guy, you know, taking medicine for their ADHD or their, or their depression and all they need to do is exercise. Um, another thing would be, it's like you're not even trying. Um, uh, another thing would be, well, lying in bed obviously isn't helping you. You need to try something else. And by the way, these are complex situations because the reality is it is good if you have depression to try to get out of bed. It, it is actually good. There, there, there is evidence that trying to behave as if you're not depressed 
can help you on the path to recovery. But it's the mindset is, is if I tell it to you in a compassionate way, as in this, this will help you with your complex disorder versus, you know, get up, you lazy bum, you, you're, you're basically um, languishing in bed and, and, and being lazy. So, so what do we do about all this? Um, besides going back to my, there we go. Um, and, and last thing that she's illustrating very well is that this has a direct consequence in terms of people engaging in treatment for their mental disorders. So if you look at her trajectory in the book, she sort of has this period of describing symptoms and then she meets a very nice psychiatrist who essentially tells her this is what you have. So she goes through a period of, okay, I have this disorder. Do I have this disorder? What does it mean? What does it mean about me? But she takes a very long time before she says, I'm gonna do what this psychiatrist is recommending and actually take medication. So there's evidence that this internalized feeling that it's bad to have a mental disorder leads to delay in terms of people actually getting treatment that they need. And where it's important, it is important, for example, for mood disorder, because there is evidence that there's a kind of kindling process where the more episodes you have, the more you're gonna have. So technically, if you want to, to prevent a rather severe disorder, and in her case, it was severe enough, uh, it, it, it's not a bad idea to get treated earlier rather than later. And here she's saying, I don't wanna take meds. I deal with that a lot, so here I have an example from my clinic, um, and I removed any identifying information, but this is very typical, where basically I see a patient for years, and then it's a struggle for that patient. So we were sort of stuck at, yes, you have this diagnosis, and the patient comes in, and everything that I try to do in terms of treatment, I, I'm told that it, it's just not working, or it's not good, or it's got side effects, or it's making this, it's doing that. So this is um, a young girl who was one of my toughest patients, a uh, very, very cute uh, young woman who basically developed bipolar disorder when she was very young. I always remember her because I was pregnant and I was about to go on maternity leave and I had just evaluated her. At the time, she just had depression. And in children and adolescents, the norm is you start with depression and then you, you develop uh, mania in that order. And so I was going uh, on maternity leave and she looks at me and she goes like, I have a new name for you, okay? And she says, Dr. Globe. And then I went on maternity leave. By the time I came back, she, she had developed a lot of symptoms of mania. So this young girl was sick for years and basically sort of danced around uh, her treatment needs. And then finally, years later, I get a letter from her and. She is in a great university, is taking the medicines that I wanted her to take all along, and basically is saying, um, I just want to, to let you know how much I appreciate your help. There were times I thought things would never get better, but they have. It's taken a lot for me to get to this point. So one of the things that I've had to adapt with is that stigma is a part of the presentation of my patients. It makes, I mean, I, I, I don't mind that. I mind it for my patients. Uh, but it's not to make the light of the fact that you probably have compliance issues with your patients too. But I think that the compliance issues in psychiatry are huge. And they really have to do with, with this. The other thing is, so related to compliance, sort of, really getting on with the program and owning everything that you came about your illness so that you're doing good self-care. So here is an example of this very smart woman who's smoking a lot of pot. Part of it is her culture, but there, there are tons of papers that suggest that pot and depression and mood disorders don't go well together. So stigma is both something that we are concerned about because of its pernicious 
influence an identity, but also because it literally harms people um, who need help. So what can be done? So I want to leave enough time to talk, but one of the things that I will open, so not everything, is that we, we, we need to hit data. So if more people are fluent with the statistics, um, the normativeness of mental disorder, the impact of stigma, how common it is, I think that, that that's, that's very helpful. The other thing is that uh, there are actually best practices for workplace where you can operationalize. So this is an example um, of a website that says, you know, how do you create a mental health friendly workplace? And that's very important. So even in the medical center, we don't really know how to behave very well when one of the faculty or one of the residents has a uh, mental disorder. There's a lot of reinventing the wheel as if it's a special case. It's not, like from my point of view, there are similar issues across the board with any illness. Can you function in your role? Can it uh, be something that is integrated in your role as a physician so that you are capable of enough self-care that you're still a professional? Those are the fundamental issues, but, but people sometimes get confused if it's a mental disorder. Um, what else? I'm gonna try to go back to Uh, and then study extraordinary outliers. So I'm not going to open this, but I'm going to tell you, have you guys heard about a city called Gill, which is in Belgium? This is, so this is an extraordinary outlier. And that's what's wonderful about the world, is that basically there are places like Gill. So Gill is a community which since the Middle Ages has a completely unique approach to the integration of people with severe mental disorders and their community. So you can go on YouTube and you can see example of, for example, a family that consists of a couple and then two or three people with mental disorders who live with them. And these are people united with bonds of cooperation, love, affection, feed, they share meals. And, and so this integration of people with mental disorder, not just in some halfway house at the outskirts of a community, but actually in the homes of people is really unique to this particular uh, city. Uh, and I think that we can learn a lot about the power of that kind of approach to make people better. So it doesn't get rid of the mental disorders, but it certainly makes the misery that is associated with any disorder much better. Um, and then finally, I'm going to tell you about resources. So you obviously know a lot about hopefully the resources that you guys have on campus. Uh, I know that some of my colleagues who work at the Habif Health and Wellness Center are actively trying to make things even more user friendly for students. So if they're not, I want to hear about it. Uh, and they want to hear about it. Uh, and if you go to the website for the Habib Health and Wellness Center, there's a link for emergencies and crisis. There is also a group called Active Minds. Do you guys know about that? So it's basically a university group uh, which is um, uh, concentrated on mental health advocacy and they have a Facebook page. Uh, I have listed here, and so this is something that I can make available, so many, many mental health resources. So that ranges from apps to websites to uh, places that have information that I think you could find very helpful. Uh, there is also a link to the National Institute of Mental Health, which has a lot of information and a lot of summary of literature. And finally, there's my email. Um, so we are going to wind down. These are my boys now. <laughs> Did anybody go to school with Jacques? No? Uh, so this was us in Quebec uh, uh, about a month ago. And finally, I will acknowledge Rebecca Wanzo, who is my comic book goddess friend, got me to do this. Robert, who helped with the preparation uh, of this um, 
lecture, Ellen Forney obviously who provided us a wonderful medium for this discussion, and Stephen Hinshaw, if you're interested in stigma, he has a book called The Mark of Shame, which is full of really detailed, important statistics about surveys on stigma, the history of stigma, and the history of um, research on this particular topic. And now we can have questions. Thank you. on you guys because I don't know you, but I'm sure somebody has a question. Okay. Usually when this happens with medical students, I go to whoever I know. <laughs> so. Yes? So that's a very good question. And I think with your question, you're illustrating that I can't possibly have summarized my field to you. And, and, and so your question is fair. The reality is that I actually do use quantifiable instruments that, that are well validated. So for example, there's something called the Young Mania Rating Scale, which examines a range of domains. And I don't just typically, because of the age group that I treat, look at what the patient is feeling. I look at what people are reporting. So typically when I see a young person, their reports from teachers and their reports from parents. And so just so that we understand, the vast majority of people who have illnesses just of emotions do not even come to treatment. Usually your behavior needs to be impacted. Kids do not walk themselves to doctors. You know, you remember being a kid more recently than I. Kids don't go like, I think I have this illness and I need to see a doctor. They depend on caretakers to notice. So the typical story for a kid is, there's something about your behavior. And that's one of the things that I'm evaluating. In terms of decisions, um, I think it's very individualized and it really depends on the patient, the family, the resources. So, so basically, I'm very fortunate in medicine because my job requires that I get the whole story. I love stories. And basically, to really help a patient, um, I, I need to know a fair amount about them so that I understand the kind of world they live in so we can think about changing that. But there's definitely more objective data than maybe I communicated. It's not, I think there is often a perception, in part because um, I can't distill what I've learned in 25 years to you so rapidly, but basically it's like any skill. We have a lot of experience examining uh, symptoms of the mind, and we have very specific systems for that. And even though we don't have ultrasounds and other kind of more modern tests, there's actually a fair, we, we don't have problems with reliability. We may have problems with validity, completely different story. But basically, we, we're pretty good at diagnosing. We're pretty good at diagnosing. So, other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a question about understanding how to engage with people who, who you don't know whether they have a potential illness or have not an undiagnosed mental illness or whether they're just um, difficult. <laughs> yes, yes, you know, yes. In the workplace or for students living together, there are people that are difficult to engage with, mm -hmm. and sometimes you think, oh, they're just purposefully difficult, right? They don't, yes. they don't want to get along or they're being jerks, or they may have mental yep. health issues that you, you can't know about or you, you, know, you can yep. pop diagnose. And how, how do you engage sure, with them sure, in sure. an offensive way so that, so that you sure. can get along and get this done? 
Sure, so that, 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 that's like a thesis, your question. <laughs> but, but basically, I will tell you two things. One of them is that I obviously glossed over the whole aspect where we, we try to understand why it is that people with mental disorders are singled out. You know, there's evolutionary reasons that if you, if you don't behave like somebody who should be part of the huddle, and defend you against bears, they're excluded. You know, that's a very human behavior. Um, I think that the point is that people with mental disorder, even when they have behavior that seems hard for you to understand, are not quite as dangerous as they're made out to be. And also that there is a pernicious snowballing effect that happens when you start moving away from them and then they perceive that and then it, 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 it makes the situation worse. Going back to your question, so there are places where experiments are going on. So for example, there's a medical school in Georgia where they really have implemented these workplace sort of, we're, we're gonna treat mental disorders like everything else. And it's a really interesting experiment. It's not always going smoothly. So for example, they, they, they were talking about having a high level administrator who was really paranoid and very difficult to deal with. And, and trying to extend all the rights and privileges to that person that you would to somebody from another diverse group. So it, it, I don't think we know enough to answer your question, but I would say that in general, the first job is sort of internal, sort of examining your own prejudice and your own reaction to that person and how much of a layer you're adding once you're sort of thinking like, they're crazy or they're difficult because in general, in difficult interactions, even if it's 1% you, you can own that percent and try to make it better. So that would be my general recommendation. In terms of do you talk to people about their mental disorder, that's very tricky. I find that I can't. So I'm a psychiatrist. Research shows that stigma extends to mental health workers. Uh, if I talk to a person that I know not too well and I say, I notice you're consuming water and really everybody else is eating and you're not and I try to sort of compassionately assess whether they have anorexia, it usually doesn't go well. So usually, um, and I know because I've made that mistake, you know, I've sort of gone through periods in my life where I thought, the hell with stigma, why is it that I can't, what, why, why is it that I would, I would say, Robert, you need an x-ray, you're coughing. You know, this, this sounds like it could be pneumonia, but I wouldn't say, hey, you know, you're really looking tired, you've been very negative, you know, do you think you could be depressed? So I live in a world where the rules are, if I do that, it's gonna be a bit threatening to people. I don't know if you could, but what I would recommend is having open-ended conversations with people. And certainly, I think that if we start revealing our vulnerabilities, and I'm not saying walking around with a t-shirt, you know, some of these things feel private and depending on our temperament, we don't necessarily want everybody to know everything. But at the same time, um, I think that having the courage, especially with people that maybe you trust, to talk about difficulties that you have, maybe setting a model and a stage to, to, to help people then open up to you. So I think where it gets tricky is when I'm like, you know, I'm completely normal and I'm fabulous and you're deranged. <laughs> then it, it sort of goes downhill, so. You had a question too. Yeah, um, you said, and you go into medicine, you often have these sort of savior complexes where you, you think, I have the expertise. And, and I, I, I'm a training director, so one of the things that I do is I help young people not be frustrated. Expect that it's normal, that people will have ambivalence at the very least, sometimes downright resistance about treatment. So for me now, it's very easy. I deal with it patiently. 
I deal with it by finding common ground with my patients so that eventually, even if it takes years, it doesn't always take years. Th this letter is an extreme example, but it's an extreme example of something that happens sometimes more rapidly. So basically, I'm patient. I, I also explain the parameters, you know, so if your hair is on fire, I will throw water on it. So basically, if you're behaving in a way that is completely out of character and I'm really worried about your life, then I will become paternalistic, potentially, and, and I could have you go to an emergency. But in general, if you're behaving at a different range, if you're just miserable and maybe your relationships are miserable and you're not doing as well as you could, you're calling the shots and I keep having discussions with you uh, and it usually works, but it doesn't work in one conversation, not always. So yes, ma'am. What, well, last question. Okay, last question, okay. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of stigma about giving very young stroke as that patient, especially for being a diagnosed really young with ADHD and it's a lot of arguments for someone with ADHD and they medicate it away. What do you do with that? So you're, t you're asking me about stigma or is there a lot of malpractice? I think it's kind of both. Just this idea that if a child is very um, active and very distracted with lots of changes and they go and get a diagnosis about the misuse of medication in that sense? So I think you're, you're asking a very important question about a reality that is complex. When people examine whether kids are getting too many medications, I think what they're finding is that there are certain kids, the poorest, the most disenfranchised, who may be, um, so for example, children in foster care are more <coughs> likely to get medications. Uh, children with parents who may have limited resources, perhaps, but very young. But there's also a lot of kids who could benefit from uh, treatment, not necessarily medication, but treatment who are absolutely not getting it. So it's really a bimodal reality. Um, the reality that in the United States, a lot of children are on medicines and that they're not in other country is a reality. Uh, I could talk your ear off about why that is, and that probably wouldn't be fair to Dr. Stratton, who wants me to end, but, but let's just say it has to do with culture, has to do with the way we parent, our conceptualizations of children, our patients, um, and also the availability of alternative approaches. So. Well, I actually don't want to end, but we, we have, uh, we respect of your time. Please join me in thanking Dr. Glowinski for her <laughs>